ideas, you torture the logic to get to that conclusion, even if you end up mathematically contradicting yourself on the way through, you make some nonsense assumption. I, mean, I don't know how many of you have read uh, the original paper by Gorman that gave to rise what we finally call the Sonnenschein mantle de Broeck conditions in the theory of, of consumer demand. But he gets to a point where he has to say that uh, changing the distribution of income will have no impact upon demand. He basically says, the, 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 the necessary conditions stated above seem intuitively plausible. They say, in effect, that an extra dollar of spending uh, money will be spent the same way, no matter to whom it is given. Intuitively plausible? Absolute bullshit is closer to it. But that's what they'll do to continue on. So it's not mathematics. They get to a point they don't want, they keep on going. And I think a lot of our anti-mathematical attitude in the, in the protest groups about the nature of economics comes out of not of the use of mathematics by economics, but the abuse of it. And this is partly what I think we get ourselves caught up in here. But what I want to argue here today is that a lot of what I work in, in the, and this is the complex system stuff that Steve referred to a moment ago, tells me stuff that I cannot possibly know by verbal logic alone. And the, the thing which has still become more and more striking to me over time is the way in which the model I did of Minsky back in, which I, I wrote the paper back in 92, it was only published in 95, but that model predates what's called the Great Moderation. And yet what it generated was a phenomenon that had a moderation before a set of crises and breakdowns. And if you look at the conventional economists, of course, this is what they saw, this period of declining volatility and inflation and unemployment, which they thought was all there thanks to their fabulous ma ma managing of the economy. And, you know, they were lauding themselves, congratulating themselves, and it, 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 was, it was sickening to read the literature at the time about how much they thought they'd solved all the problems of the world. Well, then, bang, the problems of the world suddenly came their way. And so far as they're concerned now, they try to treat them as two distinct events. One is due to, the, to their great management of the economy. The other was an exogenous shock, you know that sort of self-serving nonsense that they go on with these days. Well, I've now looked back at that 1992-95 Minsky model that I wrote and realised there's something that even Steve can't object to here because when you put the equations in verbal terms, you get a set of identities. In other words, they're not me saying that this is a model I've made up that I'm going to now see if I can fit to data or anything else. They are actual verbal identities stated in a dynamic way. So the employment rate will rise if the rate of economic growth exceeds the sum of product population growth and labour productivity. That's simply a definitional fact. If you expand it out, you get that result. The wage share of output will rise if wage demands exceed the growth in labour productivity. Also a fact, given again the way we define those terms. And the final one, the ratio of private debt to GDP will rise if the rate of economic growth, a uh, rate of private debt growth exceeds the rate of economic growth. Now, first of all, they're three facts. You can't, you can't disagree with them. You can say they're incomplete. You can say that the model I put together off them later is, is incomplete as well, and in various ways that it is. But also, there's nothing about those verbal statements that tells you anything about how a model built on it will behave. So I'm going to go through fairly rapidly through here, showing that's, this, those, that's stating those three verbal statements as mathematical identities now. So the first the lambda is the employment ratio, ratio of labour force to population, Omega is the wages, wages is a share of, of GDP, and D, little d, is the ratio of private debt to output. And those are three identities. Now, what I've, just, just to show that they are identities, I was going through how the various bits and pieces lock together there, so I won't take you through that in detail. We don't want to spend too much time in presentations today. But those are basically all the various expansions that go on there. So even once you put the mathematics there, there's nothing about the maths that tells you how it's going to behave either. You have to simulate and see what its behaviour is. And when I did my paper back in, in 95 or 92, I used a John, a John Blatt's uh, expressions for nonlinear relationships in, uh, between the level of employment and the rate of change of wages. And then I used exactly the same format for capitalist response to the rate of investment response to the rate of profit. And since I did that, I've had neoclassicals saying, oh, all your results come out of using exponential functions. Now, I knew that wasn't the case, but I didn't write it up in that paper that way. So what I've done since then is rewrite the model so that I can put in linear or nonlinear functions. And it's not because I believe people behave in a linear way. It's actually that the nature of the behavior of the model that came out of this is structural. And again, you can't see it without simulating it. So there's, three, there's two possible states 
this linear model gets me to. One is that everything converges towards equilibrium. So the employment rate fluctuates down towards equilibrium. Um, profit rate and wages share of output do the same thing. Debt ratio reaches an equilibrium. And when you put the three in a three-dimensional format, that's what you see going on. Now, that ain't the real world. That's what the neoclassicals thought they were in, ignoring the role of private debt in the whole process, of course. But that's what, in effect, if you ask them which one they'd choose, that's what they'd choose. The second outcome is where it looks like you're heading towards stability. And then you get rising cycles on the other side. Now, bear in mind, this is the model with strictly linear behavioral equations in it. Okay? Straight lines. It's the, 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 the dynamics you're seeing are coming out of the structure, which arises out of those set of identities I used earlier. So you get falling cycles and then rising cycles, both in employment and the rate of profit, and you've got a rising level of debt as well. And you put those together, and this is the shape you get. Now, when I first showed this to my econometric supervisor at the time back in uh, New South Wales University, a lovely man called Eric Sowey. I don't know if anybody knows Eric here, but a, a, a very hum humanist and philosophically oriented econometrician, a bit like one of the blokes in this room, I think. Um, and t Eric's reaction to that model was to, say, was to say, Steve, if you've identified anything that actually exists in capitalism, we're in serious, serious trouble. Well, that's what we ended up being. And I had, I had no idea this was going to come out of the model actually wrote the final paragraph in it saying that the chaotic dynamics, and it is chaotic, that the classification Steve used beforehand, this exists in the top row, which is chaos, but it's we now call it complexity because chaos is a <coughs> misstatement of what's actually going on. The chaotic dynamics explored in this paper should warn us against regarding a period of relative tranquility as anything but a lull before the storm, which I thought was a good rhetorical flourish in 92. It actually happened. Okay. And again, that's something you can't get out of a model like that without simulating it and seeing what's going on. Now, it was actually discovered in, in fluid dynamics initially by two researchers called Pomo and Manaville, and it's now called the pomo manaville route to chaos. And the way that they describe it is as if you have a process which is between a straight line and a curve. <coughs> and depending on the slope of the straight line, you either get equilibrium or an apparent convergence to equilibrium followed by breakdown. So if you imagine that straight line intersecting with the curve, you'd have a stable equilibrium here and an unstable one above. When it doesn't intersect, you'd look like you're reaching equilibrium and then you blast out the other side. So that phenomenon is a structural phenomenon in fluid dynamics. It happens to be, I believe, a structural phenomenon in capitalism as well, which you can only see by applying this sort of logic. So the Great Re Re Moderation and the Great Recession were not two separate events. They're two parts of the one process. And again, I would never have known this but for doing complex systems modelling of the economy. So the mathematics played an essential role. And that's just showing my little process sitting next to that stylized idea from Mo and Manaville. So when you look at the data now and say, well, let's just see, can we see any, any, any regularities in this which are not the statistical regularities that you criti criti properly criticise here, but the type of regularities come out of a complex system. That's plotting the employment rate, <coughs> unemployment rate in this case, against inflation rate. And what you have, you start over here in 1980, this is smooth data, you blast out in the period that gave Milton Friedman the, the credibility to you know, demolish the Samuelsonian consensus that went along beforehand. Then you look like you're hitting towards a wonderful equilibrium over here, and then bang, without warning, you blast out this side. Now, when I put my model up there, it's a stylized version of the same process. Big explosion in inflation and unemployment, and then cycling down to what looks like an equilibrium, and suddenly you go sideways. What's the common element of the two that's not being seen in a two-dimensional view? And you need three dimensions to get what's called complex systems behaviour or chaotic behaviour. That's the rising level of private debt. So there's something in the data that I think the model uncovered, and the model that came out, I wrote the model before the data turned up. It wasn't a case of trying to fit something backwards. This predates it. So we can learn a hell of a lot from the right approach to mathematics. And that's why I've developed Minsky as a software package to try to do that. So just to quickly show that actual system running. I um, actually got more on the screen than I thought I'd get here. But with that linear system, what you have is a period of that what looks like stability. Cycles are diminishing. You're heading to what looks like equilibrium. 
if you're ignoring the level of debt over here, which of course anybody who knows their Minsky takes it seriously, those cycles start to rise and ultimately you have breakdown. Now when I add in non-linear functions to be no more realistic in describing people's behaviour and include prices inside there, then I get the type of phenomenon we've been through of a period of diminishing cycles in inflation and employment, which neoclassicals think is the great moderation, followed by a breakdown because of the rising level of private debt they're paying no attention to, and ultimately a collapse in the rate of profit. That's without putting a government sector in there as well, of course. But that's, that's the sort of wisdom we can get out of the right approach to mathematics, which is not the nonsense neoclassicals go on with, but the modern non-equilibrium approach to mathematics that dominates the physical sciences these days, and which there's an excellent reference there for free called chaosbook.org, and I'll stop at that point and leave it for discussion later.